Grotty. Punch. Grotty. Punch. Grotty. Uppercut. Grotty. Chop. Grotty. What you looking at? Oh, you're looking at that side again? In today's world of martial arts, it seems like the options are unlimited and endless. And now here on the channel, we do encourage cross training and you know exploration. You always want to find new things to learn, but sometimes you have to be careful because not every school out there is honest and they're likely to tell you what you want to hear to get you in the door. So today we're going to talk about the eight lies that karate schools tell you. I get it, I get it. It's not always easy to find a quality school out there, especially in an age where martial arts commercialism is at seemingly an all-time high and the choices appear endless. But sometimes the bad schools can reveal themselves if you know what to look for. So go ahead and take another look. We're gonna use this as an example of eight lies that karate schools will tell you. Oh, and while you're on our channel, be sure to check out the links in the description for our Patreon and YouTube memberships. We use these memberships to keep our channel running, and as a thank you, we release behind the scenes looks, seminars, and exclusive member episodes. You can click on the join button next to subscribe to see a list of perks and membership options before you sign up. Okay then, let's get started. I'm the only one that knows the true secrets, and I'm the only one that has the lineage. Karate! This one is extremely shady and almost always a lie. If an instructor is claiming that they are the only ones out there who have the, the true knowledge or the true lineage or they're the ones who know the real art, take that with a major grain of salt, it's usually a line fit to new students. Every art has fragments and of some degree and, and association splits and many times people go off in their own ways and they claim that their way is the real way. It happens a lot and it's also easy to mud up lineage and try to manufacture lineage that isn't there. And for example, you know, we have a lot in, in Kempo too. A lot of people claim to be students of Ed Parker when in reality, they might've gone to a seminar back in 1973 and maybe saw him a couple times and they say, oh yeah, I, I was one of his students. We come across that a lot. I'm sure Kempo's not the only art that does that. You know, when people try to show off the lineage, that, that could be a little bit of a red flag. The school's worth should really be about learning the art, the application, the realism, and the quality of material being delivered. Lineage is fine, lineage is great, but it shouldn't be the selling point of a school. It should not be used as a gimmick. It should be, if anything, just kind of understanding the history of the school and where it came from. I know the true secret of leverage. Size doesn't matter. Credit! Size doesn't matter. Sounds great, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it's a little bit misleading. Can a small person defend themselves? Yes. Can you learn to leverage your body and their own weight against them? Absolutely. Does the opponent size matter? You betcha. I'm sorry, but it all comes down to it. A bigger person is a bigger person. You know, and chances are they're gonna be stronger. They might even hit harder. A larger opponent is going to require additional strategy and evaluation than a smaller opponent will. It doesn't mean you can't overcome them. It doesn't mean that you can't defend yourself, but there are different considerations. For example, a bigger person, you might have bigger targets. Is their head even a viable target at that point? Maybe you're gonna favor knees, trying to bring their height down a little bit. You know, what about grappling? I'll tell you right now, grappling with a person much larger than you is very, very challenging. Now, arts like judo and jiu-jitsu tend to favor students of the smaller statures because with the lower center of gravity, they have an advantage and get easier leverage getting other opponents. But that doesn't mean that the larger person isn't a threat. The guys I train with at the school, they can throw me, but that doesn't mean I haven't heard a grunt once or two while training. Bottom line is, a larger opponent does take special consideration. It's not the same. So yes, a person's size, unfortunately, does affect the situation. Guaranteed these techniques work 100% of the time, all the time. I'm sorry, that's absolutely false. Nothing, no technique is guaranteed. Not 100% of the time, nothing is a guarantee. We are talking about a volatile situation that usually becomes unpredictable. Whenever you see something advertised as guaranteed, you're usually finding it on, you know, an advertisement of a gimmick defense video, or maybe like a, you know, maybe a two week day camp, whatever, or whatever fly by night operation might be coming along. But that's a sales tactic. 
The whole, this technique is guaranteed, it's designed to make you feel good and not overwhelmed by a daunting curriculum by narrowing things down to just a few little bite-sized, you know, guaranteed to work techniques. It's all about sales. Unless, of course, they know all the secrets and they have the true art, then you're fine. Winning a fight is easy. All you have to do is use my bull technique. Ha! Ta! 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 It's easy. Sure, easy, 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 no problem. All you have to do is X, Y, Z. Anyone who tells you that fighting is easy has either never been in a real fight or they're just selling you some high-grade fertilizer. And this kind of piggybacks off of this technique is guaranteed. By saying, oh, if somebody does X, all you have to do is Y, is going back to the false confidence. There are always variables and there are always people that sometimes won't react to the attack for one reason or another. You know, you always also often hear people in the series like, oh, you know more stars? All I have to do is kick you to nuts. Okay, all I have to do is kick you in the nuts. All I have to do is kick them in the nuts. They have to kick us in the nuts. Everybody's kicking each other in the nuts. What does that actually solve? It's not guaranteed. Because even situations like that, the person might be on drugs, they might be intoxicated, and sometimes that strike doesn't take effect right away. So not everything is gonna work on everybody at all times. So just to say, oh, it's easy, all you have to do is X, Y, Z, I'm sorry, is feeding into a false sense of confidence. Can't guarantee that. Then it comes to schools that teach these special unlocking techniques. You know, the arts that say, well, if you hit the person right on the right pressure point here on the wrist, it unlocks three more pressure points on the arm. And if you hit those in the right sequence, it opens up an energy channel. And if you hit that five times, while spinning counterclockwise, you'll knock them out. You know, at that point, you might as well be learning how to throw a Hadouken. That's not how the body works. We're not combination locks. It's hard enough to hit one pressure point during the fight, let alone a whole sequence. It's not a Mortal Kombat move code. So no, these special sequences are all you have to do is X, Y, Z. If somebody's trying to tell you that the fight is that easy, again, they're either lying to you or they don't have the experience to know better. MMA, our techniques are not designed for the playpen. Okay, this one's a little bit of a gray area. Sometimes people will ask, oh, if the art's so good, why don't we see it in MMA? Well, the one answer we hear a lot is, it's not meant for the ring. So to be quite honest, we need some more context for this. There are some arts that really aren't meant for the ring. Weapons arts, you know, such as kendo, for example. You know, you're using swords and you're practicing sword fighting. You're not gonna see that in the UFC. And there's martial arts that offer, you know, more of a cultural aspect and maybe they're focused on tournaments, you know, versus self-defense. And there's a lot of reasons why people join a martial arts school. But if the school is boasting themselves as a self-defense school, then there should be at least some combat models and concepts that you could carry into the ring. And even if they aren't in the ring, then they should at least have some sort of their own competitions with resisting opponents. So if a school is telling you, oh, it's not meant for the ring, then chances are they're trying to come up with an excuse to not have to validate their own school. Sparring? The bull techniques are too deadly for sparring. Too deadly. Too deadly to demonstrate. I have a few problems with this one. First, it's just as ambiguous as, it's not meant for the ring. It's usually another cop-out answer. I mean, there could be a lot of reasons why an instructor won't show you a specific technique. Perhaps they're older and they can't do it anymore, or they're injured, and it's just not a move that they can perform anymore. Or maybe, possibly, you might not be ready for a technique. You know, if, if you're a beginning student, a lot of instructors won't let you see the advanced material until you're ready because you can get hurt if you're not familiar with it. But to say that the art is too deadly to demonstrate it or show it or spar is a little fishy. And it also, it's a sign that that school doesn't spar. And if it's a self-defense school, that's not a good thing. And also, there are plenty of deadly arts out there that have been used in history. Warfare has some seriously down and dirty arts, and yet schools find a way to train and practice with them. And funnily enough, sometimes the dirtier and nastier the art, the more sparring and competition that they'll do. It's all about regulation. If it really is dangerous and it can't be shown safely, then that's a sign of a lack of control and poor teaching practice at that school if they refuse to show you material because it's too dangerous. You will have to register your hands as lethal weapons. This one's gone around for a long time. I even heard it my first day of training. And it makes sense too, you know, we are learning to defend ourselves and we're learning to turn our bodies into weapons. So as a new student, when you hear someone say, oh, you know, when you get your black belt, you know, you're gonna have to register as lethal weapon. Sounds good. Is it true? No. 
at least not here in North America. How would you even register? Like, what would you do? Would you go to a police station and say, hey, by the way, I just got a black belt in XYZ art, I have to register? There's really no qualifications, there's no guidelines for that. A lot of schools say that, and it's also used in advertising in the martial arts because it sounds cool. It sells the allure of self-defense. It gets you in the door because everybody wants to be a badass in their own mind. That helps sell that image. Now, don't get this confused with registering within an arts federation or governing body. That is a very real thing and common, and each association is gonna have their own rules on that, so be sure you know what the guidelines are. However, with all that being said, if you do have martial arts experience and you encounter a situation where you have to use that experience and you hurt somebody, law enforcement might take your training into consideration. And we actually did do a video on this topic. I recommend checking it out. It's called Too Much Self-Defense. And it talks about you know, the appropriate levels and the amounts of defense and, and how to kind of try to stay out of trouble as much as possible. So I do recommend checking that episode out. You are the one. You need to sign up for my black belt Ultra Elite Membership right now. And that answer is often used for exactly that, to upsell students on uniforms, patches, and bonus classes. Now, martial arts prodigies do exist. Some people do pick up the arts and are naturally gifted and can learn faster than others. And in my 20 plus years of training on and off work with children, I have seen a couple of them that were gifted and they were able to advance like that and they picked up the material quick. But that doesn't apply to everybody. You know, they're a diamond in the rough and it's rare to come across a student like that. So take a look around the school. Does this instructor have so many prodigies that he has to make a special class just for them? You know, when everybody's a star pupil, nobody is. And those are some common lies that less honest martial arts schools will tell you. It's not always easy to find a quality and ethical school, so if you hear any of the answers that we went over today, I would put a serious red tag on it and proceed with caution. A school should be confident in its own standing and not have to try to convince you that you'll be invincible or learn special secrets or have to join a special membership in order to feel like the favorite. Except for all you Patreon and, and YouTube members, you guys are totes our favorite. I'd love to hear your experiences in the comments below. I'm sure you've all heard some whoppers about secret techniques and lineage and you know how, how you're part of the special class now. So let us know your experiences and thank you so much for watching.